so good to be with you here this morning as we study this very important lesson. Um, this lesson, it doesn't come alone. That's the first thing I want to share with you all. This lesson, it's part of a package. And as you all know, it's part of the package of the least of these, which is our quarterly for this, uh, well, for this quarter, our subject for this quarter. And up to this point, we've been studying about creation. We've studied about how God created a perfect world. We studied about how that world was corrupted by something, by a disease called sin. And we've been studying progressively about how God is dealing with this problem and how he uses us to be of assistance and to be of help to those who are in need, to those who are uh, suffering around us. Now, our memory text this, uh, this, this week, and just so that you know, Pastor Sean already touched up on this, but the title for this week was Mercy and Justice in Psalms and Proverbs, and I find that beautiful. The memory text comes from Psalm 82, 3 and 4 that says, Defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. Now, that being said, I'd like to tell you that at least for myself, I don't know about you, but at least for me, these two words, justice and mercy, they, they present to me a kind of conundrum. Because if you think about it in a certain way, justice can be seen as the opposite of mercy to many people. What is just? What is justice? Well, when someone says, well, that's just, that's fair, that means that that was that was warranted. That was something that was expected. Justice is what I have by right, right? It should be at least. So I did justice or someone did justice for me. Someone acted upon what, well, I already deserved. Now, when you go to the other side of this subject, you get to mercy. Mercy is the opposite of that. If, something, if someone is being merciful or someone is receiving mercy, did they, re did they deserve that? Was it based on merit? No, mercy isn't based on merit. Mercy is something completely, uh, it's a God-given trait that, well, someone didn't have to do anything for that. Mercy is given freely. You don't deserve it, you receive it. It's a gift. So these two words, they present in a certain aspect, in a certain way, they present um, opposites. They're opposites. Justice is what um, someone deserves, and mercy is what people don't deserve. They're opposites. Something that I find interesting is that justice, at least for a lot of people, uh, and everything that has to do with justice, so uh, a judge, for example, or judgment, is something that today is seen with, with good eyes or with bad eyes. Bad eyes. For many people, they don't want to be judged. Have someone, has someone ever told you, you know, don't judge me. I don't want to be judged. People today don't like judgment. Bible talks about judgment in a, different, in a different way. And the reason for this is because for many people, justice is seen as um, retributive. It's something that God uses to condemn them. I don't want God to judge me. I don't want to be judged. I'm terrified of biblical judgment or judgment at all because that is a measure used to condemn me. That's why, for example, that Martin Luther, the great um, medieval reformer, he tells us that from his ordination in 1507 in Erfurt and then later on in Wittenberg in Germany, he used to say that he was mortified about this, this topic, justice, or the judgment of God. He was terrified of it. He would self-flagellate himself. He would fast and he would punish himself. All of this trying to uh, please a severe, di di uh, tyrannical God. He was terrified of this concept of justice found in the Bible. Luther went on to say that he would prefer to hear the name of the devil than to hear the name of Christ because he was terrified of God. He used to be scared of God. Later on, he was saved from this agony when he found through the Bible, including many texts in Psalms, he found that justice in the Bible was the contrary of what he was thinking. It was the opposite of what he believed through Psalms such as Psalm 71 verse 2 that says, Deliver me in your justice and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Through texts such as these, Luther found out that justice was not the measure that God used to condemn him. 
You see, justice in the Bible, judgment in the Bible, has nothing to do with what God demands from us. It has to do with something that God offers to us. Justice in the Bible isn't uh, uh, demanded. It's offered. It's a gift. Living through, Christ, through God's justice and living in God's judgment, judgment is a gift. And Luther, when he found this out, he went on to become the great reformer that we found out that we know that he was. You see, that is how justice is presented in the Bible. Even though these two words, justice and mercy, can seem as opposites to us, in the Bible, mercy is one of the arms of God's justice. You see, God is, in essence, just. There are two supreme qualities that if we could talk about, you know, God in, 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 in two, or describe God through two words, it would be justice and love. Justice and love. And apparently these two words, they're contradictions. But when applied to God, they walk hand in hand. God's justice requires love. And God's love requires justice. And one of the greatest aspects of this that we find in this lesson is that it is described through the book of Psalms. Now, who we know that many people wrote the book of Psalms. It wasn't just one person. But there was one that wrote many more Psalms than anyone else. Who was this? King David. King David was the main author of the book of Psalms. And we also know that Psalms, it was the hymnal book, right? It was the hymnal book for the Jewish uh, nation, for the Israelites. So these were songs written to God, praise songs, songs of praise, songs of lamentation, and so on and so forth. So these, uh, these songs, most of them written by King David, who was King David? Think about it for a second. We're talking about justice and we're talking about mercy. When you when you realize that in the setting of the Psalms, it becomes very curious because King David, even though the Bible describes him in the book of Acts as a man according to God's own heart, we see that David, he wasn't perfect. One of the greatest uh, defects or the greatest sins that we find of King David in the Bible was when he saw Bathsheba, became enchanted with her, took her for himself, devised this Machiavellical plan um, that ended up with Urias' death. Then Prophet Nathan comes up to him and says, look, this what you did was wrong. And we see, we see that David, this is why perhaps he was a man after God's own heart, because even though he was caught in his sin, he didn't make up excuses. He had no smart answers for God. No, he admitted freely, I have sinned. Now, in the way that God dealt with that sin, was God just? Yes, a severe consequence came about in David's family because of that sin. But at the same time, was God merciful with David? Of course he was. David was one of the recipients of God's mercy. He's one of the greatest examples in the Bible. Do you see how these two subjects, when they're, when they're applied to God, they have to walk hand in hand? God's justice and God's mercy. God's justice and God's mercy. As a matter of fact, at least 15 times in the Old Testament, we find that someone cries out to the Lord and God says, I have heard their cry. Remember, do you remember at least one instance where this happens? The Israelites in bondage in Egypt. And we read in Exodus 3 verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. God heard their cry. God heard their lament. At least 15 times in the Old Testament where God acts with mercy because he hears the cry of his people that are suffering. God acts with mercy. These are examples of how God is just and how he applies his mercy upon his children. Now, the biblical books of wisdom, and we've already touched up on this a little bit, but the biblical books of wisdom, they have a lot to say about these, th this duality, these two words. Um, the biblical books of wisdom, and here's the amazing fact for the day. You know that the Bible isn't organized in a chronological way. I'm sure all of you know this. The Bible is organized thematically by themes. So for example, we have the first five books of the Bible, which are the books of origin, the origin of the world, everything that happened. God created the world. You have the, um, the entrance of sin in the world and how God explained that he would fix this problem. Then you have from Judges through Esther, you have the books of history. These are the historical books of the canon of the Bible. Then you have 
the books of wisdom, the sapiential books, or the books of poetry, as they're called, and these go from Job all the way up to Songs of Solomon, and then the last books, the prophetic books of the, of the Old Testament, and that's how the Old Testament is organized. The books of origin, the books of history, the books of wisdom, and the prophetic books. And curiously enough, the New Testament is organized in the exact same way, except there's a shift in, in, in subject, in theme. If the Old Testament is talking about the world, the New Testament is talking about the church. So the first four books of the, of the New Testament, the Gospels, they're the books of origin of the church. Acts is the historical book of the New Testament. The epistles are called the books of wisdom of the New Testament. And then you have Revelation being the book of prophecy of the New Testament. Now the books of wisdom are very interesting because they, they hold the content. At least in the New Testament, they hold the content for the church. And in the Old Testament, they hold the wisdom of the kings of Israel and the wisdom and the songs and the poetry of the Jewish nation that describe the Messiah, that describe day-to-day -day things of life. And this is the beauty of the book of Psalms. You'll find that it goes all the way from the most day-to-day -day normal aspects of life all the way up to the most complicated, deep and profound aspects of our religion of the Messiah and what he was going to come to do and what they waited for. The biblical books of wisdom have much to say about the concept of justice and the concept of mercy. A few of these psalms, a few of these chapters in psalms, a few of these songs, they are called the psalms of divine justice. There are a few of them, and I'm sure that you've read them maybe a plenty times going through these, this hymnal book, which is psalms. The psalms of divine justice where we often find this plea for God to apply his justice, for God to be merciful upon a, a given situation, diverse situations of life. In a very practical, day-to-day -day sense, justice is something that we often want, right? We want fairness. We want justice. I remember many times when I was a child, you know, maybe three or four years old, sometimes six or seven, and you know how siblings are sometimes, right? They're always fighting and squabbling, you know, and arguing with each other. And many times when justice was done from the power above our parents, I would say, that's not fair. Have you ever said that before? Maybe to siblings? Maybe uh, in, in your office, in your school, or I'm sure you have. This isn't fair. And you want fairness. You want justice. Now, the problem is that oftentimes what is fair to you is unfair to someone else. So that's why it's so good for us, us to have a, a mediator, which is God, who is unbiased. But even that is something curious. We'll, we'll talk about that um, in a little while. One thing that I'd like to say is that you'll find in these, in these psalms of, of divine justice, you'll find this tension between what is justice or the desire, the plea for justice, and at the same time, the fact that sometimes justice doesn't come the way we expect it, the way we want it, or when we want it. God is always just. God is always fair. We know this. It's one of his divine qualities. But the problem is that God, oftentimes he postpones his justice at least in our way of seeing it. And you'll see this, for example, in, in Psalm chapter 7, sorry, Psalm chapter 9, you'll see this tension between a plea for justice and the fact that justice hasn't arrived when he asked for it. You'll see this in verse 7 through 9 where it says, But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a, re a refuge in times of trouble. So what is this text saying? It's saying that God is just. It's saying that God is a refuge, that God, he will exact justice. But at the same time, in the next part of the chapter, you find that there is wickedness, that bad things do happen, that unfair situations in life, they come about. And you'll see this, for example, in verse 13, it says, Have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me, you who lift me up from the gates of death. And you go on reading and you see that David is saying, Lord, I know that you're a refuge. I know that you are just. And I know that you will bring justice for my cause. But Lord, look at what's happening. I'm having troubles. I'm surrounded by these pains and afflictions. Lord, please judge me fairly. Please save me from these iniquities. We live in a world of corruption. 
We know this. All around us, we don't have to go very far to see that we live in a world of corruption, in a world of injustice, in a world of um, sin. Not long ago, a few years ago actually, I'm, I'm from Brazil, and Brazil is going through a very difficult political period right now. And a few years ago, they unearthed, they discovered one of the, the worst scandals, corruption scandals in history, where more than $1 trillion dollars had been stolen by a political party, had been stolen from the government. One trillion dollars, that's a lot of money. We live in a world of corruption, in a world of sin. And it seems many times that the better you are, the more you suffer. And it seems that the wicked people, those who, who act deceitfully, those who are corrupt, it seems many times that they are the ones who prosper, that they are the ones who have it good. Have you ever thought about this? Sometimes it seems, you know, Lord, I'm here. I'm trying my best to do the best. I'm trying my best to follow your path and to walk in your footsteps. And Lord, it seems that the more I do that, the more I suffer, the more I lose. And at the same time, Lord, look at what's happening with these people. Look at what they're doing and how apparently they're prospering. This is a plea of Psalm chapter 82. Psalm chapter 82, verse 2, you hear David crying out to God and saying, How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? This is, apparently some people would assume that this is David talking about God. Lord, how long will you judge unjustly? Can God judge unjustly? Of course not. So in this text we find that the call of Psalm 82 isn't only to God, but it's to these leaders who are corrupt. David is saying, look, you are being corrupt. Can't you change your ways? And this is a, an anthem in the book of Psalms. In Psalm chapter 73, verse 3 and 9, we find a similar request that David makes to, to God where he says, Psalm 73, verse 3 through 9, that tells us, For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. They are, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. And David goes on describing these wicked that prosper. And finally, we arrive in chapter 82 where he just said, look, how long will you be like this? How long will you judge unjustly? How long will you be corrupt? Can you see that this isn't anything new? It's not from our days that people are like this, that the world is like this. It's not from our time. The world is unjust. In the days of David, in the days of the prophets and the kings of Israel, we find that Israel would go deeper and deeper into sin. The kingdom of the north in Israel, it's, when you read the, book of, the books of Chronicles and Kings, you find that not one of the Israelite kings, not one of them in the kingdom of the north was good. The Bible describes them as they continuously doing what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord and walking in the footsteps of their fathers. Not one good king in the kingdom of the north. In Judah and Benjamin, in the kingdom of the south, you find a few good kings, but in the middle of corruption. You'll find one or another that comes along every few generations and they try to fix the things that have happened, but it's too much to fix in one lifetime. This is not a new problem. This has been going on for a very, very long kind time. And because of this, not only were the kings and the leaders corrupt and unjust, not only did they treat their, their, uh, their population unfairly, but the population, per their influence, became corrupt. People became corrupt. The nation became corrupt. And there was much suffering around them. Up to the point where, and I don't know if you know this, but from Babylon on, from the exile of Babylon on, with a, a small pause between the, the kingdoms of Greece and Rome, Israel was never free again. It always was subject to one power or another. For about 80 years between the, the, the rule of Greece and the rule of Rome, uh, Israel was free. But other than that, always in bondage, always uh, answering to someone above them, always. Psalm 82 is a call of desperation, where the psalmist he is calling out, crying out, not only to God, for God to act, but also for the corrupt leaders to change, to turn from their ways and to act with justice, 
for them to act with mercy, for them to acknowledge God in their leadership. Look at what he says in chapter uh, 82, verse 3 and 4. Please defend, I put in the please, please defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and the needy and free them from the hand of the wicked. Here is David calling out, look, you who are corrupt, you who are unjust, stop it. Defend the cause of the poor. Defend the cause of the needy. You know, we live in a world today where people try to take matters into their, into their own hands. We see many politicians, and I don't know how many of you, I've never been that um, interested, or I don't know much about politics. It's not my calling in life. But it's very difficult for you to see everything that's happening in, in the, in, not only in the country, but in the world around us. Several politicians promising so many things, promising justice, promising a better life, promising to better the world and better the nation. The promise is, is when you've been lied to so many times, you become skeptical. There are just so many promises out there for health and for finances and for safety. And this is something worldwide. The solution will not come through that. We discover this through the Bible. Media, mainstream media with their movies and their series and their magazines and their shows and their books also promise many fixes. This is what you'll find in superhero movies where ultimately mankind is, is the solution to its own problem. Have you noticed this? In these movies and these, these series and everything in, in media, you'll find that the main theme, the main idea that they're trying to convey is that we are the fix. We are the solution to our own problem. We've been around long enough to see and to know that we are not the solution. As the humanist philosophy would, would, would like us to believe that we are the cure. That, and you'll find this through and through, through literature, through history, through politics. What was Marxism? but an idea where mankind can fix its own problems. The, the idea of the uberman, superman. We can fix our own problems. Many believe that it's through enlightenment, knowledge, the advancement of, of technology. And this way we will bring, finally, we'll bring a better world, a world that is just, a world where everyone can live perfectly in harmony. These are not the solution. These things are not the solution. The solution is a just God, Amen. the biblical God. What's more is that unfortunately in many moments of our life, and this is something very real for us, I don't know who you identify with more, and you don't have to answer this, okay, because it can get quite you know, embarrassing, or, 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 but who do you identify with more? The, those who are suffering, those who are under oppression, or those who are causing oppression. I believe that in many moments of our life, unfortunately, we, you know, humans can be bullies. In many moments, we are not the ones that are oppressed. We are the oppressors. That's why I find it so interesting and so important that David here, he makes a call to those unjust rulers. Look, defend the cause of the poor. Defend the cause of the needy. And that's a call for me and for you today. Look, stop being the way you are. Defend the cause of the poor. Defend the cause of the needy. The call of Psalms 82 is for both groups. The oppressors should turn from their ways and the oppressed should place their hope in who? In politics? In technology? In, in media and humanist progr progress? No. In God. In the Lord God. Have you ever turned your eyes upward in a moment in life going through a moment of injustice and Turn your eyes up to God and sighed, apparently saying, Lord, why don't you just come back and fix this whole mess? Have you ever done that? I do that a lot. <laughs> I do that a lot. Lord, please come back and fix this mess. Everything's become so chaotic. It's such a big mess. But here's the beautiful thing of, of the book of Psalms. It gives me hope that God, he will execute justice. The dreary days that we find in the world around us and in our lifetime, there will be an accounting for them. God is just. God is just. The only answer for this whole problem around us is a sovereign leader, a sovereign Lord. Now, on the same note, and this is where we find the progression of the lesson this week, it starts off 
with uh, Psalm 82 when it goes on to Psalm 101. And on the same note, here's the thing. We all exercise influence over other people. We all have opportunities of, of acting acts of justice. All of us do. Now, are we sources of justice? As humans, are we the source of justice? No, we're not. We reflect justice. God is the source of all justice, and we reflect that. You know, I, I remember when I was small, I saw, and this is very, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you've seen it, but I saw this picture that had three little monkeys. And uh, one of the monkeys had his hands over his mouth, another one had his hands over his eyes, and another one had his hands over his ears. You've seen this? All right. And in one of the pictures, and it, had, uh, it was the one with the monkey over his eyes, and this never left my mind, it said, monkey see, monkey do. Have you ever heard this? Monkey see, monkey do. And this is the reality about humans. Humans, we imitate. You know, we imitate people. I've already told you the story of my little brother where we caught him one Sabbath morning shaving because he had seen my father shaving that same one. My brother was four years old and we caught him shaving, you know, with all the, the, the apparatus and the, the shaving, the, the razor. And he looked at us and he said, you know, children imitate their parents. That's exactly what he said. Although he said in Portuguese, children copy parents. Humans are creatures of, of habit, and we are creatures that imitate. That's what we're good at. Monkey see, monkey do. Now, for you to be just, if you are not the source of justice in this universe, if it doesn't come from, from you, you know, when it comes to God, God has two kinds of qualities. God, God has incommunicable qualities. What are they? What are the incommunicable qualities of God? Omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. We... God can't communicate that to us. We cannot be omnipotent. We cannot be omniscient. We can't. These are qualities that we simply don't have. But God has some communicable qualities. For example, justice and mercy. These are things that we can learn from God and we can put into practice in our own life. So um, when it comes to justice and when it comes to mercy, we find that for us to be able to practice these qualities, we have to learn them from who? From God. We have to learn them from somewhere, from someone, and we learn them from God. David, he, uh, he composes this list of Christian virtues, of Christian, Christian qualities, and we find them in Psalm chapter 101. We can't read the whole, the whole chapter, but we will go through each verse and the lesson learned so that we can be Christians of justice and Christians of mercy. For example, in verse 1, we find that we need to live a life of praise and recognition of who and of what God does for us. Verse 2 tells us the importance of seeking wisdom to walk before God. Uh, verse, chap verse 3 tells us the importance of protecting the outlets and the inlets of our soul. Everything that we see in here, again, you can remember um, the, the, the picture of the, little, the three little monkeys. You have to protect the inlets of your soul, the things that you see, the people that you walk with, the places that you go, the things that you hear. You have to protect the inlets and the outlets of your soul, of your mind. The importance of distancing ourselves from things that are harmful to us. This is done proactively and actively. The way we live, the places we go, the people we talk to, in a very active way, and sometimes even proactively, they will be a judge and they will be a, an influence in how we live. We have the importance of being real, verse 5, of being humble, no slandering or being haughty. Verse 6 tells us and teaches us not only the importance of keeping away and removing ourselves from things that are evil, things that are bad, but proactively associating ourselves with what is good, with those who are faithful. And in verse 7, we find the importance of being truthful and of upholding integrity. I went through a whole list, and we could, we could preach a whole sermon about this chapter, but unfortunately, we don't have the time for that. So when you're interested and you want a list of qualities of how a Christian should live under justice and under mercy, you'll find them in Psalm chapter 101. All of these qualities are meant for those in positions of leadership. This is a, this is a kingly psalm. This is what we, we learn. But here's the thing. Christians are a holy priesthood, a holy nation. And wherever you go, you will exercise leadership. As a Christian, as someone who lives for God, you will exercise leadership. Be that in your office, be that in school, be that with friends or with family. 
people should look to you as a leader, as having the quality of someone who, who has these virtues in their life. Someone who is true, so someone who is just, someone who is merciful, someone who associates with what is good. And that's why the king here, he gives this quality for leaders, but they apply for all of us. Now, a problem with this is that on this side of eternity, we're not born with these qualities, are we? We're not born with all these virtues. We're not born with justice. We're not born being merciful. These are things, again, monkey see, monkey do. We imitate what we see. These are God-given qualities. And the question is, how do we acquire them? How do we become these things? How do we practice them? There's a story that's told of this man called John Harvey Dunnant. Sorry, John Henry Dunnant. And John Henry Dunnant, John, he was a young, brilliant Swiss banker. And in the year 1859, he was sent by his bank to the Austrian Alps, where Napoleon II was waging war against Austria. And Dunant went there with the uh, objective of asking Napoleon for permission to start a new business venture in the country of Algeria. But when he got there, he saw the cannons blazing, he, saw, he heard the muskets firing, he saw the wails of men being wounded and dying. That day, 15,000 men died. And that changed him. That changed this man. The scene broke his heart. He spent the entire night caring for the wounded along with the other volunteers. Caring for the wounded, taking care of them. And he was never the same. Money simply didn't, didn't matter that much anymore to him. He went back to Europe and he went from country to country meeting with, with uh, state governors and with country presidents and he was uh, eloquently, very eloquently making a cause for peace. This man, John, John Dunant, went on to found what we know today as the Red Cross International. And he received the first ever Nobel Peace Prize. The fact is that when he was confronted with the reality that the world wasn't what he thought it was, when he was confronted with the reality of those who were suffering, he couldn't remain the same. God gave him a purpose. Now, if he hadn't gone to the Austrian Alps, to the middle of that war, would anything have happened? I doubt it. He hadn't been confronted with that reality, with the need. You know, Jesus, there's a song that says that we have to co go out of our comfort zone to, meet, to see Jesus. We have to go out of our comfort zone because Jesus isn't in the comfort zone. Amen. Jesus is not in the comfort zone. That's hard for us. We like living with this, these shades over our eyes. Apparently, everything is fine. No one is in need of mercy. There is no injustice around us. Everything's okay. That's our comfort zone. But just as John Dunant, sometimes we need to leave that comfort zone and be confronted with the reality that there are harsh realities in this world. There are hor horrible situations. You know, sometimes we have this... this idea, this crazy idea that God will use me, and bear with me, okay? Don't, 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 don't take out of context what I'm saying. Sometimes we have this crazy idea that God needs me to go to bless someone else. He needs me. The fact of the matter is, is that God is already exercising justice. God is already being merciful. He is already out there, out of the comfort zone, and he is acting. He doesn't need me. It's my privilege to work with him. It's a privilege. He doesn't need me. Before I had the brilliant idea of helping God, he was already helping this world. He was already serving this world. As we find in the book of, of, of Acts, where it tells us about Jesus' Jesus' greatest, uh, well, his ministry, what he did. This is in Acts 10, chapter, chapter 10, verse 38. Here we find Jesus' mission, what he did. It says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. That is Christ's mission statement. He went about doing what was good, acting for those who were being oppressed by the devil. You see, we need to be near God. 
We need to be close to him. We have to learn from him because when we see what he does, when we learn from the true source of justice, when we learn what mercy truly is, we will want to act. One of the greatest problems that we face today is that Christians, they want to be activists. They want to give a lot of social help and go out and help. But the problem is that many times we forget the reason for this. What is the reason for all this activism? Is it because we are good? No. And that is the main difference between Christians and anyone else who does anything good, but not for the right reason. You remember the parable of the Good Samaritan, one of the w most well-known parables in the Bible. And Jesus is asked a question. The Pharisee asks Jesus, after a series of, 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 of sentences and, and a, a conversation that goes, upon, that goes on with them, the Pharisee asks Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Remember that question? Do you know why he was asking this question? Who is my neighbor automatically draws a line. Because if someone is my neighbor, what does that mean? That someone isn't. So basically what the Pharisee was asking is, well, okay, Lord, well, then who is my neighbor? Who will I treat with justice? Who will I have mercy on? And who can I forget? Who can I ignore? That's the nature of the question. And then Jesus, he goes on. He doesn't answer him outright. He gives him a parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan that we all know. And at the end, Jesus asks him the same question, but with a little change. What does Jesus ask him? Whose neighbor was he? Do you see the difference? On the first question, on the Pharisee's question, the, the, the question is, who's, who is my neighbor? And in Jesus' question is, well, whose neighbor was he? Was the Samaritan? And the answer that is invoked by the text is, everyone, anyone, all are my, I am the neighbor to all. The question isn't, who is your neighbor? The question is, to whom are you the neighbor? That is the beauty of this, of this message. When God talks about justice and of mercy, it is to everyone. When we read the book of Proverbs, when we read the, we read the book of Proverbs, and this only appears on, on Thursday in the lesson, only one day for the book of Proverbs, but we'll find that through the text presented, we see that sometimes people, they, people make bad decisions. And if it were up to them deserving our mercy, they would never deserve it. There are some people that simply make many bad decisions. There are people that dig their own graves. You understand, right? There are some people that dig their own graves. Now, if you were to ask, well, you know, do they deserve my mercy? The answer would be no, because mercy is something that many times we assume to be by merit. You know, they were bad. I won't be merciful upon them. But if I'm to take the biblical, if I'm to take the Bible seriously, if I'm to take the parable of the Good Samaritan seriously, everyone deserves mercy because mercy has nothing to do with merit. Mercy has to do with me understanding how just and merciful God was to me. And I will pass that on. It is about reflecting his character. So when I read these texts in the Bible about mercy, about love, about the justice of God, I have to understand them biblically. Not through the encyclopedia, not through the dictionary, because then I'll have missed the whole lesson. In the Bible, mercy is the right arm of God's justice. Because without it, there would be no salvation for us. If it were purely through justice, there would be no salvation for us. But praise God because he is merciful. He is abounding in mercy. And he gives us the privilege of acting out his mercy through our life. Who is your neighbor? Everyone. To whom are you a neighbor? Everyone. May God bless you. Everyone here at the Granite Bay Church and also those who are watching far away from us, perhaps in another country, may God bless you and give you the ability, the strong desire to reflect his justice and his mercy to all of the people around you. May he use you. May he bless you. We're going to be turning off now, signing off from our Bible study hour. May God bless you. And now here for our local congregation, I'd like you to reflect on these words, reflect on this lesson, and may God bless you and allow you to act out acts of justice and of mercy.
We are going to have a short intermission. We'll be reconvening at a quarter to 11. I'd like to call the deacons up for the offerings so we can have a prayer for the offerings and also a prayer for the end of our Sabbath school. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we thank you so much because through your communicable traits, qualities, and virtues, we learn, Lord, that we can be like you in many ways. Lord, we want to learn from you how to be just. We want to learn from you how to be merciful. Father, in a world that is being run over or has been run over by corruption and destruction, wickedness, selfishness, Father, we truly want to be just as you are just. And we truly want to be merciful as you are merciful. Father, actually, we, when we read the pages of the Bible and we learn that uh, there are two comparable texts that say that we should be perfect as God is perfect and merciful as God is merciful, we see that the true measure of perfection is in mercy, is in imitating your, your nature, your, your character, Father. So please give us the, the blessing to learn how to do that. Lord, now as the offerings will be collected, please multiply them, Lord, for wherever they will go. Um, may they be enough, Father, for the teaching of the gospel in the areas that they reach. I ask you to give us a giving heart also so that we can understand that you give us the privilege of participating in this. I ask you these things, and I praise your name in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Mm -hmm.